Great, we're gonna take the time machine for a spin back to 1939. Uh, no particular uh, uh, reason I picked that other than there were two major world's fairs going on and people taking lots of pictures. So I figured that was uh, good enough. Uh, and I just thought I'd start with a, a, a group of vote on things. Uh, I had, there were three things I was gonna try to do. One was uh, New York City, uh, one was the New York 39 World's Fair, and one was the Golden Gate Exposition in San Francisco. Looking at the number of pictures I pulled roughly out last night, I probably won't be able to get to all three. So I was thinking of doing San Francisco next week and then doing uh, New York this week. So who would like to start with the uh, New York City and, uh, and who, who wants to start with uh, the 39 World's Fair? Anybody have any particular thoughts? I'm flexible. Looks like a 39 is sorted. New York. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's, let me, uh, I think I'm going to start with uh, New York City just for the heck of something different. And let's, so let me just get uh, this ready here New York City. And one of the things I'm hoping is that some people can tell me what some of the unidentified statues or bridges or celebrities or random things might be. Because um, again, although I am an ex New Yorker myself, some of this stuff is absolutely uh, Greek to me. So let me just uh, get going here and share screen. Okay. Okay, everybody see a big building? All right, uh, this is the Empire State Building looking up at the uh, the top of it. Some of these pictures are kind of easy to identify and others you have to know the building. This particular one I happen to recognize the, the building so that, that was a big help. This one I got a kick out of, uh, we have a horn and hearted uh, automat back there. And I don't know if people that were not from New York uh, know what an automat is or was, because unfortunately they're out of business these days. But it was a great facility. You, you walked in and there were all these banks of glass lined uh, little windows and you would take your, your money a nickel, dime, a quarter, drop it in, open the door and take out a piece of pie or a bowl of chili or a, a turkey or a ham sandwich or whatever. And you would close the glass door and then the uh, platter inside would turn around, rotate, and then come back again with another turkey sandwich or bowl of chili or piece of pie. My brothers and I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. We kept thinking if we could only get one of these put in our kitchen at home, that every time you open the door, a piece of pie came out and it seemed to be unlimited pieces of pie back there. We thought this was gonna be great. So they, they were really a, a, a super thing. It was right near, one near my dad's office down in lower Manhattan. And we would uh, go there and, uh, and enjoy the Horn and Hearts. I believe they were also in Philadelphia, a number of other cities, but uh, over time they 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 are gone. They're actually you know, part of, excuse me. Yeah, I I just want to say that I uh, lived in Chicago, but I feel like I knew about the bottom hats for a long time, and I wonder if I saw them in some classic movie. Might be. Uh, it was really funny. My dad was telling me during the depression they were really popular because people would go in, you could get hot water for free uh, to make a tea. You had to buy the tea bags, but then you could also get ketchup for free and people would go in and start pouring ketchup into the hot water to make uh, free tomato soup. So uh, I think that actually made it in a movie. There are actually horn and hearted collectors now that go and buy the uh, banks of machinery. There's a, a guy that runs a business restoring them. So uh, Maybe someday I'll get my pie machine in, in, in the kitchen yet. So again, uh, I'm gonna hop around. You can see on this one damage. Over the years, it's part of the problem that the silver nitrate in some of these negatives uh, tends to uh, uh, migrate through the various layers of the, uh, the uh, uh, celluloid used in them. So unfortunately, sometimes you just end up with damage. If this was something I was gonna use for publication, I would come and take the uh, the damage up in the corners out of it and uh, you know mask it out and uh, take care of it but um, sometimes you just leave them good but looking up at the Empire State Building looking down from the hotel New York uh, the hotel York not New York but just the hotel York 
I'd love to go back and try to recreate some of these uh, angles. Um, again, I, I guess I'd probably have to go rent a room in the Hotel York if it still exists or not. But uh, I get a real kick of looking at some of the old uh, vehicles and uh, you know things down on the street. And speaking of old vehicles, here is a Greyhound bus line. And this is their, their terminal in New York. And if we zoom in on it, it's actually got an ad on the side of it for the 1939-1940 uh, World's Fair. So just like in the 64, they were the official bus company of, uh, of the World's Fair. And here's our fellow uh, traveler he is standing outside the Hotel York. And just imagine what one of these, I mean, it's just this random taxi back here. But imagine what this thing would be worth today. I mean, it's just uh, some beautiful classic cars. It's also fun for me being an ex New Yorker to look at some of the businesses, the names of the stores that have come and gone, some that were still there. And just the little things like the, uh, the bus stop sign that's out here, all sorts of things I remember really well growing up, you know, signage and uh, traffic control devices and everything that are all gone and not in use today. Is a co-traveler outside the Hotel York. And this is, a, again, a, a great view. If we zoom in here, and again, this is where history disappears in New York. But the Paramount Theater uh, was showing a movie with Dick, uh, Dick Powell and uh, Jane Froman, I guess, whoever she was. But uh, the Paramount was a, a major theater uh, since gutted and gone. And you can also see the, you know, the bus lines. You had, back at that point, a lot of uh, private bus companies that were servicing the New York City area. And you also had some, um, you know, some municipal lines. So there were an awful lot of different competing companies trying to, uh, to curry your favor. Great view here as we're going down towards Times Square. Um, during the daytime, the, uh, the neon's not all lit up, but you can see the framework for it. And again, uh, I left these all in full size. You can start zooming in. And you can see that Wallace Beery is in the movie MGM's Wyoming with Leo Carrillo and Joseph Kalia. People almost forgotten out here, we have Leo Carrillo State Beach to remind you who he was, but uh, others are just about gone. And more men wear Bond clothes than any other clothes in America. And you'll see why in Bond's 10 New York stores. And I don't think Bond's clothes is around anymore, uh, but uh, there was also Whalen's Drug Store down below. Over the, to the left, you can see a bag of uh, Planner's Peanuts, and at night uh, that uh, animated so the peanuts came cascading out. A bag a day for uh, more, per uh, more pep, so we need to get our Planner's Peanuts. And just, again, stuff that's all changed over time. Up top uh, in the upper right here, uh, that's a giant ad for Spearmint Gun. And they had all these uh, neon fish that would and uh, eels and things wiggling that would light up at night. And, why spearmint gum makes you think of neon fish, I don't know, but it was quite attractive. Looking down from the Hotel York, it struck me and looking at the streets all look like they've just been paved, don't they? I mean, they're, they're, you think about the roads in any major city today, they're in, in terrible shape, but look at this road. I mean, it, it just looks like it's a, a billiard table smooth. Um, again, lots of uh, people out enjoying themselves, a rare new convertible in New York. Uh, I get a kick sometimes of taking some of these names of businesses. You can see a sign for Mr. Goodman's business over here and Cohen Brothers Taylor's and try to figure out how long some of these lasted in their, uh, their spots. Taking a look down at New York City. And again, it's interesting in, on some of these to try to figure out what some of the buildings were and some of them are, of course, gone now. Unknown street here. I was not able to find out where Breslau Brothers was, but uh, again, just thinking how this uh, car, if you had this today, would uh, make you the envy of all your friends, particularly any car collecting friends. And this one, again, gotten damaged from silver uh, migration, but good look at the, the buildings of the city. Some of these I've not cleaned up yet, so still lots of dust speckles and things along through them. Unknown ships at the pier there, taken from a moving car apparently. Then I, I get pictures like this and try to figure out what on earth was he or she thinking when they took it. 
an empty street with nothing of any particular interest to me. It looks like there's a train yard down below based on this tower over here. But uh, what on earth they were taking a picture of, I don't know. It looks like in New York City in 1939, you had one choice of colors in your car, black. I imagine you could get yellow through your calves. And with this, it's interesting to try to figure out how much of this was the, uh, you know, issue with the silver in the film, how much of it is the uh, air quality uh, back then. As I know, growing up in the 50s, the air quality in New York was dreadful. Everybody had their own incinerator at your apartment building, your office building, that sort of thing. And was this just a foggy day or a smoggy day? Uh, Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at that time, uh, most film was not panchromatic. So it, uh, the air may have been bad, but the film really picked it up. Yeah. 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 It's and in this one, you can just barely make out some ocean liners in the background and everything. But yeah, as you say, Wayne, the, the, the way the film's designed or you know, made at that point in time, it caught light differently. But again, you can start zooming in on some of these things, move them around, and you can start you know, finding a big sign here for Camel cigarettes and Chevrolet and you know, all sorts of advertising done at the, uh, the time on the tops of buildings. The Hotel Albion over here. So it's just different parts of uh, the city's history. So that's it for that particular folder. Let me uh, come over here. So that, those were in all 1940. And this one is gonna be for the ship fans of uh, uh, the group. This was called Fleet Week. And uh, in this particular thing, the uh, United States Navy, would come into different uh, ports for different times for a show of force. So you'd have Fleet Week in New York City, Fleet Week in Boston, uh, they'd have it in Philadelphia, uh, San Francisco, LA, and, and the, it was a big thing for the Navy. Uh, it was uh, great for recruiting, bringing people in, uh, it was a great way for the sailors, uh, and it was also a great show of force. Again, it's 1939, the war clouds are building on the horizon. I mean, there's already a war underway in Europe, and the United States is desperately trying to avoid getting drawn into it. But it's becoming sort of uh, inevitable. And we're going to see some pictures of parades with uh, uh, military hardware. But this is the, uh, the Hudson River. We have the USS Philadelphia uh, out here. Uh, it was, these are all amateur uh, pictures. But back then, it was a very popular thing for photographers to etch the name of a scene onto the negative so that uh, you would have it recorded which was great because that made it possible to uh, actually figure out what some of these things were if the uh, ship's numbers or uh, other information isn't, uh, isn't available. Battleship, the USS New York. Um, again, you can go online and figure out what happened to uh, most of these, but this was uh, one of the classic, what they call tripod masted battleships, the same sort of thing as the uh, USS Arizona, which got sunk out at the uh, Pearl Harbor, and these ships would go in a fleet, and this had gone on for years. You might remember the, the, the thing of uh, Admiral Dewey and the Great White Fleet uh, steaming around the world to show American uh, power. They would also take these um, things besides going up and down in New York uh, or the U.S. for Fleet Week, they would take them on uh, tours um, around the world, again, to make everybody realize there's no sense fighting the United States, we're going to come and get you. In this particular one, you see a ship's barge going ashore full of uh, sailors and more waiting to go uh, on here. Carol knows one of my favorite movies is uh, On the Town, where the sailors are coming aboard New York and you know, New York, New York, a hell of a town, the Broadway's up and the battery's down. Uh, and this is you know, the same sort of thing. All, you, you just think of all these sailors coming aboard and they've got their you know, 1920 some guidebook and they're gonna see all of New York in one day. In actuality, I imagine most of these guys were looking for women, but uh, you know they, they, they might be going out looking for Grant's tomb. Another view of the USS New York. And again, this was the height of uh, what you call it, American uh, naval power at this particular point in time. Some pretty massive guns uh, front and back. Uh, later years, of course, the later newer battleships absolutely eclipsed it. 
The USS Nashville, this was a heavy cruiser, not a battleship, so you can see it's slightly smaller. Uh, the major thing that's different, if you look between the two of them, the massive size of these guns compared to the size of these guns. The battleships basically could throw a shell about as heavy as a Volkswagen, 20, 30 miles. So they had a tremendous uh, artillery power. On the back here, you can also see a, a crane. These ships came with a seaplane that uh, they could take uh, off, drop on the water, could take off, come back, land, be hoisted back on board. For everybody who lives in Brooklyn, you get to enjoy the, the cruiser USS Brooklyn. The USS Honolulu. Again, lots of cruisers. We had, uh, of course, as most navies did, more cruisers, destroyers, and I think battleships being in the, uh, the minority. USS Savannah, one of the gas tanks we talked about on a prior trip, uh, prior talk, how they would fill up with gas and the weight of the gas would push it out into the pipes. Interesting here, the SS Britannic, this was a steamship. Uh, uh, there was the SS Britannia, which is the, the Queen's yacht, but this was the Britannic. So uh, in this particular one, you can see a tugboat uh, warping into the port, another ocean liner going on. The port in New York in 1939 was just an absolutely incredible, busy, busy place. Uh, so much going on. You just look in this one uh, picture, the Britannic uh, is getting turned around. Another ship in the background, ferries going by, more ships over docks getting ready. This is a sub chaser, smaller a destroyer uh, out here, the 386. This is one of interest to New Yorkers. It's the Firefighter, a brand new uh, fire boat had just come online in 1939. Uh, I've got a number of pictures of, of it. My uh, grandfather was a New York City uh, battalion chief uh, fire department and he got us to go on the Firefighter one time as a kid. It is now preserved as a museum ship out on Long Island. I think it may be over in Connecticut at the moment. Basically each winter they take it over to Connecticut to a shipyard, scrape the hull, do major maintenance and everything and bring it back. But I think it's out in Greenpoint, Connecticut, uh, Greenpoint Long Island as it's, um, uh, uh, you know, so-called permanent home. Uh, takes a lot of maintenance and upkeep and a lot of dedicated volunteers, but it's a, a fascinating piece of New York history. So if you're out on uh, Eastern Long Island, well, go, go first because maybe you need to go to Connecticut. But if you do get a chance to go see the firefighter, it's a uh, classic old technology still, uh, still existing today. And by the way, the firefighter was still in service and uh, was uh, up to and uh, during the time of the World Trade Center disaster was one of the boats that was coming and pouring water from the uh, uh, harbor into the, the wreckage uh, out there. So it was retired relatively recently. Driving down the Henry Hudson Parkway, another destroyer out at sea. These were called four stackers. You can see the four um, uh, uh, exhausts out here, the, uh, the four funnels. A lot of these were given to England under Lend-Lease. They uh, evidently took water on board in uh, anything more than a dense fog, they got wet. They were supposed to be terrible ships, uh, but they were all that uh, the, we had at that point in time. Uh, and then we, they gave a number of them under Lend-Lease to the British Navy. If it wasn't for these old four stackers, uh, who knows if England would have survived or not. So old, old stuff today, but at that time, very, very important. This is just a nice view down the river. You can see just a whole mass of ships, barges going back out there, but one ship after another battle, they brought in a bunch of battleships and they just went down the whole length of the, the river. This guy is not interested in ships at all. He's ready to go and single out the, you know, get a, a, a hit the ball out there. But again, times have changed. Look at everybody out there. I don't think there's a man out there who would be caught dead without wearing a hat. They're all uh, dressed in their, their Sunday best. Another view again, Henry Hudson Parkway and the ships out in the river. This is interesting. This is where sometimes you have, uh, you go to look at things and you try to figure it out. Uh, the, the photographer labeled this one, the SS Votary is up in front of the Palisades of New Jersey. And there is no SS Votary. If you try to find the ship, it's not, because this was not a steamship. It's actually the MS Votary. So everybody tends to think of a, a ship being a steamship, 
Well, this was a motor vessel. Uh, it didn't use steam. It used fuel oil that drove an engine that went directly out. It didn't use uh, fuel oil that burned, that got hot, that turned a turbine or anything. So sometimes you have the MV boatery, uh, which is what this was. <clears throat> sometimes you have the MS, the motor ship boatery, uh, to distinguish it from a sailing ship. So, uh, you know, that's why sometimes when you're trying to do your archaeological research in this stuff, you first start searching and as there is no such ship, but, you know, you, you can eventually find it. Really enjoyed this one down at the, uh, the uh, base of Manhattan, the uh, old fort here, which was uh, basically, uh, as mentioned, a fort, but then it had been used as a port of entry for immigrants coming in uh, uh, to the, into the country. And it also been used as New York City's uh, first major aquarium. So um, building has seen a lot of uh, purpose over time. And I mentioned as a kid, I had a real fascination with tugboats. I really, really wanted to go on a tugboat. And when my dad was able to get us on a tugboat, I was probably the happiest kid on the planet Earth. So all throughout New York at this time, you had the various tugboat companies running uh, up and down because with shipping being such a a big thing, uh, the tugs were really very popular. Over here, we have uh, two bays for uh, uh, ferries, uh, whether they're going over to Staten Island or one of the other islands, I don't know. Uh, ship going past, again, one of my beloved tugboats in the back. This is interesting. Uh, obviously, the George Washington Bridge has a single deck uh, configuration. But if we go and look underneath it, we can see that it's been Martin's Riviera and uh, try to figure out what that is. It was a giant casino. They didn't have gambling allowed legally, although there was a lot of talk that it went on uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink downstairs. But it was a gen uh, uh, enormous nightclub, very, very popular. And uh, people could just take the George Washington Bridge over there, go spend a night. And they had quite a few very big name celebrities over there. Uh, it did really, really well until New Jersey decided uh, we're going to expand the, uh, the highway that went right by it. And we are going to carve right through the middle of uh, the Riviera. So uh, all gone now, but it's just kind of interesting to, uh, to see it pop up as, as well as the, uh, the George Washington Bridge and its original configuration. So that's fleet in the fleet week. We'll go here and just look some more at New York City. We're going to be in Brooklyn right now. And this is the Veterans Day Parade in 1939. And uh, we are watching uh, people going by here. They happen to be passing 66 Court Street, which was very nice. They had the, the number on the building, so I knew it was 66 something. And I was able to uh, do some searching and find out the street. And that entranceway that they're going through or pass on the left looks pretty much exactly like it today. Sadly, Tom McCann is gone. Uh, so is Needix, uh, not there anymore. Uh, but uh, it's interesting here, again, old signage, cars do not stop here. So if you look down in the road, there were tra uh, tracks in the road because the trolleys would go through Brooklyn at that time. And uh, of course, that's how the, the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers got their name is the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers. So back at this time, you still had uh, uh, trolleys running through the area. And uh, this particular case, they took a stop and decided they're not going to stop there anymore. The fire department was out on full uh, display, taking some of their ancient technology out here, a handheld pump truck, a bunch of drum majors and other people for the parade. These are uh, pictures that are not all fully restored yet, so I've not uh, adjusted all the contrast or gotten all the spots or dirt out of them. but. It was a big parade in, in New York at the time. And it was nice of the photographer down below to date it. And we hop over to the uh, skating rink at Rockefeller Center. Like I said, some of the uh, some of these pictures held up very well and others uh, they they suffered their ravages of time. Central Park, great fun. You can see a couple kids in their sleds out there. And we used to go, my dad would take us to Prospect Park in Brooklyn and we really enjoyed it. And it was a hill 
that everybody calls Suicide Hill. You go back there now and you look at it and you go, well, maybe it's a hillette. I mean, it wasn't really much of a hill. But, you know, the six-year-old kid with a sled and trees in front of you and very little ability to steer it, uh, you can understand why I got the name Suicide Hill. It wasn't so much the speed, it was the trees you would hit on the way down. Now, this is the sort of thing, if, if, again, if people do know what some of these statues are, the next one's really easy because it's got a name on it. But I do not know this particular statue, and I'm not sure what particular park this is in. So if anybody recognizes he, either who he or she is in this, uh, please feel free to speak up, throw it in the chat, or uh, drop me a note later on. As I said, some are easier. Mr. Erickson. Of course, General George, we can all recognize him. And again, I'm not quite sure which one this is. Showing I've been out of New York for a few years. Wondering, was that to Columbus Circle by any chance? I was wondering that too. Uh, is this uh, yeah, Columbus Columbus Circle that I was trying to figure out uh, here? I, I have to go find a good view of Columbus Circle and go look for it. Yes. Yeah, thanks for suggesting that. And here looks like a statue plinth, but no, nobody on it. Another statue in the background here. Central Park, a uh, long lost boathouse here, but uh, swans are out enjoying themselves. <clears throat> and the last one up here, the photographer evidently was heading out of town and he went through Sing Sing. So, uh, or went through Ossining. There's the famous Sing Sing prison. The railroad ran right by it. So you could get this picture going right on the train. You can see the guard towers up here. And this, of course, is, you know, when they were all talking about in all the Jimmy Cagney movies, uh, ah, yeah, going to send me up the river, huh? Well, this was going up the river, up the river to Sing Sing. And this is where uh, New York had its uh, famous uh, electric chair, Old Sparky. So this was uh, a spot you did not want to go to. So um, it was a good spot to take pictures as you went by, but not spend any time there. One more for ship lovers. We're going to go and spend some time along the uh, the, the port uh, here. The Queen Mary, which is now out here in Long Beach and evidently is falling apart. Uh, it's been closed for two years because of the uh, pandemic, but the city of Long Beach found out that the company they leased it to uh, let it go into absolute wreck and ruin. And I think they're saying it's going to be $83 million to preserve it, and they're, they're working on it. They were actually, um, you can see here, they got three lifeboats uh, that are, you know, uh, lowered partway down. The city of Long Beach is selling off the Queen Mary lifeboats because they're in dreadful shape and they're afraid that they'd fall apart or fall on people. But they said they think they have the potential for being restored. So if you would like your own genuine Queen Mary lifeboat, the city of Long Beach is the place to go to. Again, uh, love some of these pictures, being a fan of ships. Uh, down below, you can see it, it, they did have cars that were other than black, but again, mostly taxis. And uh, the sh ship is being guarded by some policemen here. One over here, another standing here. <clears throat> Out here, the Queen Mary is now sailing down the Hudson River. So uh, going on her way. And here's viewed from one of the circle line tours. Here's the other side of the ship at the dock. The negatives sometimes are kind of out of order in the folder. <coughs> Excuse me. Port view of the Queen Mary. And again, see how well it shows up here. You can start zooming on some of these things. And you can see the General Motors is the second lowest priced car. So I don't know if I advertise that I have the second lowest price car because that would make me instantly wonder who on earth has the lowest price car. I might, I might say my car is the best mileage or you know, the best sounding radio or something, but you know, we're almost as good as the other guys coming by our car. So I got a kick out of that, but big signs back there for Pontiac. So if you came in to uh, the Port of New York aboard the Queen Mary, there was a giant ad for GM in front of you. Or you could also go over, we'll zoom in over here. If you didn't want a car, you get a, a bottle of Tromer's malt beer. 
which is a brand that has totally absolutely disappeared. So uh, I don't know how good Tromer's beer was, but it's no longer with us. I got a kick out of this one here. You can get fresh cut, real pure five cent ice creams. So uh, taste and tell. So uh, he doesn't have fake ice cream. He's got the real pure stuff. And they're right, this is a dead end. If you kept driving, you would go into the Hudson River and you'd be dead. Because if the water didn't kill you, the pollution would. And again, we got the Queen Mary sailing out to sea. This building over here in uh, New Jersey is still there. It's been restored as a giant, it was a giant ferry terminal. And also where they brought a lot of the car uh, floats with uh, rail cars from New York over there. And it's now restored as part of the, uh, the gateway park over there. This is the Isle de France, another uh, famous ocean liner. View from the other side of it. And up here, this is where the bow lookout would go. He'd have a tiny little spot to stay up here in inclement weather. And here is a fuel barge that would come on board. Uh, they, uh, uh, a lot of these ships would come in, stop for a couple hours, uh, maybe a day, and they'd be heading right back out. So all of these ships, uh, whether they were coal-fired or oil-fired, had to have these barges that would come on, uh, on alongside and then hook up and re-provision uh, them. You also had other ones that would come aboard uh, with uh, uh, fuels, uh, food supplies, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so all these ships had their own derricks. You can see all the little cranes up here. Most cruise ships today don't, uh, but they would be uh, constantly busy when they port because it'd also be taking people's cars that they had brought overseas and the hold, they'd be lifting those out, bringing more supplies in, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Again, a bunch of the, the tugboats that were so, so much fun. Just various views of the various shipping lines. Uh, so many of them gone now, the American Hope. Hawaiian line, the Hamburg American line, North German Lloyd line, uh, all these uh, basically are all, the companies are gone and the, uh, uh, the peers are all gone. <clears throat> the SS New York steamship here. So before we saw the USS New York, the, uh, the uh, battleship, and here's the SS New York. A bunch of coal barges loading up. Uh, th this one is actually a tanker. It's not a coal barge, it's the tanker Wakanda. And over here, the AJ Patmore. And you can see all the mountains of coal waiting to get uh, loaded on board. You can also see why the air is so bad in New York in 1939. The Charles S. Ashley, a shipping, uh, I mean, a fishing ship, and they would actually come into the port of New York at the time. But remember, we've all heard of the Fulton Fish Market, and it was a real big operating business. And uh, the ships would come in, right coming in from the uh, the, the shipping, uh, the fishing uh, sites offshore, and come right in. Ships like this were very common at that time. Some of them were still uh, uh, rigged with sails and uh, uh, bringing them in. Some were both sails and motors. And here's a bunch of uh, fish getting ready to come aboard and uh, head off to the fish market. Another liner, the SS Ancon. This is the motor vessel Georgic. This was another one where he had initially labeled the SS Georgic, but it was there is no SS. It's a, it was not a steamship. Very low profile ship. Uh, what happened with a lot of these? is they were a combination freighters and uh, ships. My dad's company used to run that too for a while, that they would have a small number of passenger uh, accommodations aboard a freight ship. And uh, they went, were slower and easier to go over, uh, you know, so if you took your time leisurely, but they also would take you a lot of places the cruise lines that themselves would not normally go to. So these uh, partial uh, freight and cruise ships were very popular with people that wanted to take a trip uh, off the, uh, the beaten path. This is the Europa, another famous British uh, German liner coming into town. You can see over here, uh, one of these uh, boats that would go up and down the Hudson River. Uh, they go up to a bare mountain, turn around, come back, but it was a pleasant cruise, people getting out of the city. 
The Isle de France is now heading out. We have Ellis Island in the background as they're heading out to sea. Another shipping, uh, a fishing ship. This is the Lily D. Bell. And again, you can go and if you're a geek for old stuff like me, you can see the House of Freda, a uh, fish company over here, private estate coffee company, uh, the Fulton Hills, or the Fulton Mills rather. Um, again, Fulton Fish Market, and now they've got a, a co coffee company over there. But all sorts of just uh, neat old vintage parts of uh, New York. The Georgic, again, more of the fishing boats. The, this is the Olive M. Williams and the Charles S. Ashley. Let's just skip through some more fishing boats. The SS New York. Just some general views of the harbor. Again, some ships were in town. I don't know if these were part of Fleet Week or they were just in for another visit, but uh, you got uh, one of them sitting out there. The Dakota Inn, I don't I have to look that one up to see if anything of interest about that. Okay. The Queen Mary, there's just one in here. I, I was mentioning the Carol last night. Like here, I don't know what ship this is. Uh, the uh, name is too dark on the bow. I'm not able to pull it up. If we have any shipping uh, aficionados and can tell us what that is, please do so. One of the backwater canals. Uh, again, everything belching smoke and not particularly pretty. I don't know if it's the Gowanus Canal or some others, but that was one of the most polluted pieces of water upon the entire planet. Somebody took a trip out to the Statue of Liberty. You can see the uh, cruise boats taking you out there, looking down from up above. Whoops. One of the boats bringing more people out. This is a really weird shaped boat. Uh, I mean, it's uh, again, the superstructure is comes up, goes across, goes back down. I don't imagine how well this thing was uh, out in a storm or something. But this is again what they would do in some of these ships. You have uh, uh, you know 10, 12 cabins put people on board uh, and they, they ch charged a good price for some of it. And some of these were uh, uh, said to have excellent cuisine that the, uh, you know, that you were not sailing on a tramp freighter, you were sailing on a, uh, a pretty nice uh, ship with, uh, you know, everything done with fine cutlery and linens and the rest of it. But they would just go to different places. And a lot of people uh, enjoyed that. Another sh fishing ship. There's just one more I want to get to in here, uh, just almost near the end here. So you can see it was a busy day, huh? What's going on? There's that strange ship again being towed. Okay, this is uh, one that I, I found interesting. Uh, again, nothing particularly uh, uh, interesting about the ship, but if you zoom in on it on the back, you can see the name. It was the Black Turn out of New York. And it's very rare these days to have a New York registered ship or a U.S. registered ship because that means you have to have a U.S. registered crew and you got to pay uh, U.S. wages. So that's why almost every ship you see is registered in Panama or you know some other particular place. This particular ship was built in 1919. Uh, it was part of the Black Diamond uh, line. You can see the, the Black Diamond up on their, um, their smokestack here. And uh, so this was taken in 1939. Well, in 1942, the ship was acquired by the British uh, Ministry of War, and it was put into service trying to bring urgently needed supplies from uh, South America up to uh, England. On, I think it was his first or second such run. It was torpedoed by a German U-boat. 
and sunk off the coast of Brazil. So it's, it's just kind of interesting. You think that, you know, in this particular case, it's sailing along fat, dumb, and happy. And, you know, the sailors are having a good time. And three years later, this thing is sitting at the bottom of the ocean in an act of war. So it just kind of struck me as how, uh, you know, uh, uh, how everything is uh, temporary and we, we just move on. So let me get out of here. I'm going to do this next bit from New York City real quick. And I need everybody to mirror these images, uh, flip them over backwards because when, when they were scanned, they were mislabeled <laughs> in the envelope. And so these guys are actually walking from left to right. So when you see the parade going by and you see all the signs that are backward, no, you're not having a stroke or you're not dyslexic. It's just Bill has not mirrored them over again. But this again gives you an idea of how uh, the United States was marching off towards war. This is again, 1939 or it might be 1940, I'd have to check. But uh, they're marching down the road. And you know, again, I got the clue that everything was backwards when I started trying to read the, uh, the road signs or the things on the drums. But uh, there's quite a bit of them out here marching. If anybody happens to recognize these distinctive arches in this building, I'd, I'd love to know. But here's where they're coming through. A guy up here photographing or filming uh, the uh, uh, work. Uh, hopefully he's pulled to the side and then not going down the road. The, the driver is looking up at him, but that had to be a kind of precarious uh, pitch. Uh, it was actually interesting because this whole military parade, uh, they had, uh, you'll see some guns, you'll see some uh, uh, searchlights and that. But in this particular case, you've got these guys because it's a mobile field, uh, army field kitchen. So they're talking about how you need everything for war. And these guys are coming down and they've got a big stove and some pots up on it. And they're all dressed in their white uh, mess clothes. And coming down the road with a machine gun. Another one in the background here. So they're all set. And again, small cannons. Uh, these particular ones are being towed. I've got a really neat set of uh, other pictures of anybody ever wants to go into uh, 1930s vintage military armament. I bought a huge collection from somebody that I was trying to buy 39 World's Fair stuff, but he had all these pictures of cannons and tanks and training films and airplane crashes. So if anybody wants to do uh, the US military in 39, I can do that sometime. But basically these would be trucked in, wheeled off, these platforms that are stuck out here would flip off to the side as places for the gunnery crew to stand. So they're in mud or bad conditions. They're not standing in the mud, they're standing up here. They'd raise up the gun and go shooting and they would time them how fast they could get it off the truck, you know, out there and into firing position. It was only a matter of minutes. Giant searchlights, uh, they were being all over the place. Look at the size of this, this searchlight here. Uh, after the war, they were sold off surplus, and out here in L L.A., we had them for years at movie premieres. Giant carbon arc lights, um, you know, uh, immense uh, lighting power to, to do it. Now, they, uh, when they do it, they tend to have giant LED ones and the rest of it, but this was uh, anti-aircraft lights, and it was a big thing in New York that if the Germans were going to attack, they were going to be, you know, using spotlights like these to, to track them down. Now, yeah. Go go back for a second. Yeah. Uh -huh. Behind the uh, searchlight, it looks to me like uh, one of those aircraft listening uh, apparatuses. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. that's what my guess on it was a two Wayne. I wasn't going to embarrass myself by guessing it. I was going to tell me no, it's a something or other. But yeah, this looks like there's a Donald Duck cartoon, which uh, shows us one of these uh, really well. They would put them out there and listen for uh, air enemy aircraft coming in and uh, basically have headphones attached to amplifiers. And in the Donald Duck cartoon, uh, he's listening and uh, the kids start playing a trumpet in it and almost deafen them. But then a, a pesky fly comes by and it goes in there and Donald hears it and starts calling in the, uh, the fact that the uh, fly is here and he's giving the coordinates and of course, He's giving his own coordinates, and you can imagine when the shelling starts, what, what happens. But yeah, pretty, I think that you're exactly right what those were, Wayne, is uh, giant acoustic horns for, for listening for, uh, for aircraft. Thank you. Struck me on these uh, pictures, too, the uh, parade. I just had to work a parade event last week, and I was talking about how we had it. The first hour was so damn hot. 
we had about uh, 20, and we had about 40 LAPD personnel there to uh, guard 150 people at the street fair thing. Well, here it looks like the same thing. If you look, there's one cop, two cops, three cops, four cops, five cops, six cops, seven cops, eight cops, you know, they're all over the place and there's no people around. So I don't know where this is. If anybody recognizes this, I'd love to know. It looks like they're all watching a bunch of seals in this uh, area here, concrete here for Seal Island. Uh, there's another shot and this uh, Natalie dressed gentleman is walking away. But again, you can see it looks like a, a seal thing, a bunch of bird uh, cage over here. If anybody happens to know where this miniature zoo is, uh, I'd appreciate it. More for the parade. And that's it for the parade. So uh, I think that will do us for New York City and we're Still got some time, so we will get to the New York World's Fair. Uh, again, like when I did this uh, visit to 1964, these are gonna be in all sorts of total chaos, no order, uh, because I, uh, I, I scan them, put them in folders, and then when I copy them for this, all the pictures labeled number 001 are gonna be together, then the 002s and the 003s. So they're gonna be just hopping and bumping all over the place. Uh, a couple of these might have been ones that I used in some of the books. Others are ones I've restored since then, but I uh, figured people would get a kick out of it. This is the uh, Aquacade at the 39 World's Fair. Uh, you can see uh, these uh, guys are out there. And again, I really get a kick out of the old film technology of 1939. The detail in this, I mean, you can easily tell the guy is selling keychains for 10 cents. You know, uh, I mean, what you start thinking about it, this is 80 years ago, and this stuff has held up really, really well. And you can zoom in on it here, and you can see what he's selling you here, and all the, the little jewelry and all the rest of it. You know, I would say most of the pictures taken today are not going to be around in 80 years because nobody, everybody's going to have lost their phones. They, you know, the software will be gone, whatever. But this is just great, great technology. Back here, you can see the live uh, orchestra that was getting ready uh, to perform in the show. They had half of it here, half in the other tower. Uh, we're going to hop around, as I mentioned, all over the place. Ford Pavilion. Again, everybody very well dressed. Uh, one of the things I really get a kick out of some of these pictures of the women's hats. They all make me feel like I'm watching Murder Law in one of the uh, Thin Man movies. I mean, the, the, some of the hats in these ladies are just so stylish, so, so chic, and they're always at such a jaunty angle. I, I really just got a kick out of how well people dressed up looked for the time. Very rare uh, view of part of the World's Fair. Uh, this is their kitty land over here, uh, carnival land. Off to the, right in the center here is a uh, toboggan ride. You could see the, uh, the path coming down. So you would climb up to the top, get on it and slide down. Over here was uh, uh, an island, uh, a, a mountain rather, and a, uh, 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 another uh, ride that came down it. But uh, some parts of the World's Fair get photographed over and over and over. Obviously, the Trilon Ferrisphere, the Ford Billion, or whatever. But for some reason, some areas just nobody took pictures of. So it's it's always a kick for me when I go across, you know, buy somebody's collection of 100 pictures, and I've seen 99 of them very, very well and very, very often. All of a sudden you come across another one and you go, yep, that's why it's worth keep getting more. That, that was an early version of the Matterhorn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very much Brock. Yeah, and uh, yeah, maybe that's where Walt uh, got his <laughs> huh? Yeah. And again, just a classic street view out here, the French pavilion in the background, the big plaza out here, uh, the US pavilion would have been behind us. DuPont's in the world of chemistry. And again, if you just look down here, and I think this lady shows up in another picture, but she, she and her hat and other people are all dressed very, very nicely. DuPont, I've got some color pictures that is very nice with these, uh, all these uh, giant uh, versions of a chemical processing plant all done in different colors. And it lit up really, really nicely at night. Uh, this here is a commercial picture. If you look over here in the bottom, you and you, Underwood and Underwood, mm -hmm. They had the uh, official photography uh, uh, concession for the fair. So this was one of the entrances. This was the Corona Gate uh, going into the fair. So 
In the 64 ferry, remember those giant pylon towers to draw your attention to the gates? Well, this was the 39 version. There was nothing in these that were just there purely for show and to have uh, a spot that when people are trying to figure out how do I go home at night, I look for the giant towers I came in from and that's the giant towers I go out from. During the fair, they had a major exhibit for uh, not the whole fair, but for a week at, outside the uh, uh, New York City Pavilion. Uh, so they brought in all sorts of antique fire gear. Um, you can see in this particular one, they put the names of the, the years on them. And uh, they had a whole line of it. So New York City fire truck from 1912. Another kind of not often photographed part here. This is the Firestone Farm. And uh, they had uh, examples of how uh, modern farming is going to be coming and done. In the background, you can see the uh, uh, sign for the flower and garden show. And th they had a big uh, area there, gardens on parade. You could go and buy the plans for a house and, and, and build the house. And if you didn't want to buy the house, you could just sit out here in the patio and enjoy a, a, a quiet moment. The George Washington statue, again, it was all done out of gypsum over a steel framework. Uh, it was really a spectacular statue. I think it stood about 80 feet tall. There was real talk about, uh, we've got the mold that we made this thing out of. Why don't we make a giant bronze statue and put them in the park after the fair ended? We're going to use the profits from the park and do that. Well, it became apparent the fair wasn't going to make a profit, so a bunch of people started raising money, and then World War II came along, and they said, we cannot use the metal to make a giant statue of George Washington. So we're busy already melting down statues, so uh, unfortunately, the molds were lost somewhere in time, and because there was even talk about trying to do it after the war, and then somebody found out that the molds had been broken up. We're looking down from the helicline, the ramp that took you for, uh, up to the, uh, uh, between the Perisphere and the, uh, 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 the, the Trilon, the big tower. Very empty, quiet day. Uh, down below, these uh, trackless trains down here were run by uh, Greyhound taking you around the fair. Giant uh, sundial, the man in face of time. Really a beautiful work. This is one of my favorite, favorite pictures of the fair. Again, I just love people catching, you know, the, the random stuff out there. And in this particular one, you have all the wonders of the fair, everything out there, you know, Futurama, you know, the uh, wonders of air conditioning at Ford and everything. And if we zoom in on this particular one, there is a dad buying ice creams and, and stuff for his kids. I mean, I, I just, uh, and it's also kind of fun. You can see that, you know, giant ice cream cone only 10 cents and stuff. But uh, I just got to kick the, the boy looks, he's just too jaded. Who the hell needs an ice cream cone? But I, I just uh, really enjoyed that, the, the simplicity of that picture. Big show being held out here uh, for military members. Uh, uh, they were commemorating that Rockefeller Center is now open. But uh, this was one held for the military uh, out in front of the US pavilion. You can see part of that in the background. And it was a giant stage show by the brand new, uh, you know, Rockettes of this brand new thing called Radio City Music Hall. And I've got a number of these. And again, they'll be out of order because they're going, uh, you know, again, 01. But you can see with balloons, U-S-A, they're spelling them out here. And uh, sad to think that within a year or so, you know, how many of these guys are going to be out at war and, you know, all the things that happen there. Glass Pavilion. And inside the Glass Pavilion, they're showing us how they're making all the glass pipes. And, uh, you know, I, again, I got to kick this guy's out here forming glass over flame and bending things around. But, of course, back then, everybody wore a tie, even if you were doing stuff like that. The Great White Way, the amusement area. Um, it was a, a very popular area, uh, much more popular than the lake amusement area became during uh, the 64 World's Fair, because uh, in the, the Great White Way had a number of adult oriented theme shows. Uh, you know, Sally Rand and her nude dancers and stuff like that. Uh, there was also, uh, you know, uh, dodge and cars to smack into each other. And, games of chance where you could shoot a rifle and try to win a QP doll. All the stuff that Robert Moses decided he was not going to have in 1964 that unfortunately made that a very bland and unexciting part of the fair. 
but the Great White Way was, uh, was a real big thing. And for any of us that have been to World's Fair, we can relate to this. Damn tired, I can't find a bench. I'm just gonna sit down and rest my feet. So uh, even if you're well-dressed and even if you're wearing your suit, you just went out and sat in the grass and took a, took a load off your feet. This is interesting because in the 64 fair, to make it look um, exciting and uh, uh, colorful, the flags going across some of the bridges were just purely made of geometric uh, shapes. Uh, no nations, no anything. If you look at these flags and try to match them to any particular um, nation you're not going to, they're all done with transportation motifs. So you can see propellers on there. You can see some boats. You can see an uh, airplane, uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But this is all as you came into this particular section of the fair. Uh, the world on the move, uh, everything is uh, going and getting excited. So uh, nothing in here that made any sense. But in the background, Ford was smart because they put giant signs of flags up here that had the Ford name on them. Kodak and a number of these photo booths, you could simulate uh, that you would be on a sit on top of a miniature trial on a perisphere. You could go over here to the uh, uh, parachute ride and you can see the update of this one. So it's the World's Fair of 1940. And uh, if we get to it today, there's also uh, one that was very rarely seen. Uh, demonstrating if you had a camera that could go at one one thousandth of a second, one one hundred thousandth of a second, this is what you'd get as a ball went through uh, a sheet of glass. And outside of Kodak, this is very much what they had done in 64, giant pictures. And these were nowhere near as big as the uh, pictures at the 64, but this was pretty big stuff. The size of these for uh, 1939, these are about uh, six foot tall. And they invited people just like they did for 64, send in your own pictures and we'll try to put them on display at the fair. They also commissioned a number of uh, private photographers to come out. Most of these pictures are in black and white, but as color photography was coming out, they would now put color prints out there too. So I do have color images of the Kodak Pavilion. And uh, again, for people to come by and start uh, getting the idea of color photography, Kodak would give you a free roll of Kodak color film and they would teach you how to use it. They would not develop it for free. And uh, that was uh, something that was pretty smart of them. You know, the old thing, do I give out the razor blades? Uh, the razor is in charge for the blades. So I'm gonna give you this free roll of film, which costs you three and a half bucks to get developed. But uh, it was a great way to get people used to, to dealing with color. One of the pavilions I really got a kick out of the design, the uh, marine transportation pavilion looking like two giant ship hulls coming at you. Uh, I was a huge fan of the Batman comic books and Batman and Robin would always be chasing <clears throat> the Joker or the Riddle or something through giant uh, typewriters that, that the keys would actually type as you, you, know, you jumped on them or they would uh, be going through, uh, you know, uh, a, another thing, the giant toaster and you would jump on the button and it would spring you out. Everything actually worked. Well, I just got a kick of these giant boat holes. It, it just struck me as, it still does, as something out of a Bob Kane Batman comic. This pavilion, by the way, was only used for 1939. Uh, during 1940, uh, the exhibits here were moved over into a, another pavilion uh, shared over in the communications pavilion in uh, the main part of the fair. And this was used for a, a warehouse and uh, just industrial purposes in 1940. So if you see the name on the building, you know you're looking at 1939. And this is the building where they moved the uh, items. This is the communications pavilion. And over in uh, 1940 became the communications and marine transportation pavilion. Very first building built for the 1939 World's Fair, the material testing building. And this is where they came to try to figure out, uh, we have to simulate what's gonna happen for a building that we built out in the fair. Uh, if we use a certain type of stucco, is it going to stand up in a uh, hurricane? So on things like this wall behind here, they would take, uh, you know, stucco one, stucco two, stucco three. Then the fire department would come by with fire hoses and simulate gale force winds and rain to see how well these uh, things would, would hold up. Same sort of thing. They would uh, shoot uh, the stuff at the windows. Were the windows going to hold up to a hurricane? Uh, you know, just uh, kind of interesting uh uh, technique that they were doing. They had previously done this at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. 
because again, they're using so many building techniques that, that had never been used before. And would they hold up and last in the, the coldness and the storm and everything of both Chicago and New York? So this building, of course, did not survive. It, 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 I think it was there right up to the opening day and was used as an administrative building. But uh, this was, again, the very, very beginning of the 1939 World's Fair. This is uh, Grover Whalen here uh, and Mayor LaGuardia. So here's LaGuardia and Grover Whalen. And they're at a ceremony to announce that the 1940 World's Fair is going to be on. Huge, huge debate on whether or not the fair was going to be there second season. And as I've mentioned in prior talks, it was always sold as the 1939 World's Fair. It was never sold as the 1939-40 World's Fair because the Bureau of International Expositions would not have uh, charted it if it was going to be a 1939-40 World's Fair. It had to be one six-month window. So they did the 1939 fair, but I've seen the contract with General Motors, and it basically really says the 1939 World's Fair, which if we do come back in 1940, we hope you will participate. You have that option and acknowledge here that you would participate. But uh, they weren't sure because it lost so much money in 39, but Grover came out here, they did a big speech on Asabi back in 1940, and then they fired him and brought in another guy. <laughs> Something you wouldn't do today, Morris Guest, world's greatest midget town. So you could pay your admission. This again, a picture that unfortunately has had some uh, structural damage, but you'd walk in and, and get to see little people living in a little village and they uh, uh, drove little cars and they had a, a little mayor and a little town hall and lots of little shops. So it was a big fascination at World's Fairs in the uh, 1930s to uh, have uh, uh, these midget towns uh, to also have uh, native villages, and we'll see some of that as well. Nightclub show, kind of dark here, but this was uh, one of the villages that they built for 1940. Again, things they uh, realized in 1939, some of the villages were real popular. Let's put a Latin quarter in here and do a big uh, nightclub dance, and everybody uh, basically dressed like they're down in, in Havana, having a great time. At this point in time, Havana was a big spot you would go to from New York uh, for a weekend or, you know, for a, a visit. So uh, big show going on. One second. National Cash Register. Uh, again, for my Batman love, I would think that Batman and Robin could jump across those keys, hit the no sale button, the cash drawer would drop, uh, pop open and knock out the Joker. It didn't, wasn't anything that exciting, but in this particular day, there were 83,509 people in attendance at the fair at that point in time. Apparently very few of them visiting the NCR pavilion, but it's a, a great thing. In the background, a ride, it was basically a vertical Ferris wheel. You went up, you went over and you came down. So you got some nice sightseeing views and you got around, but you didn't go in a circle. You went in a giant rectangle. The uh, Lifesaver uh, 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 parachute drop, again, uh, in Coney Island today, no longer used as a ride, but uh, just a, a great icon of uh, New York. Again, for folks that love trains, uh, this is the Pennsylvania S1, biggest uh, engine they had built at the time. And I've mentioned before, it's sitting in a set of rollers and you can see the sign here uh, telling you that if you wanna come back, the locomotive is going to be operated from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And they would crank this thing up, go in at full speed on these uh, giant wheels on a set of rollers and steam pouring out all over the place. Unfortunately, the uh, S1 was too big to go around most of the turns on the Pennsylvania Railroad. So it basically went from New York to Ohio. They uh, built a, a, a section of train. It was even too big to go on the turntable to turn it around. So they had to build what's called a Y, a giant section of rail that would go out, back up, go back down, and go back to New York. And it was just too expensive to continue to operate, so they took it apart. But as a train fan, uh, just a massive, wonderful piece of engineering. <clears throat> Person who was visiting the fair also got a picture of some of the more destroyers. This is actually a subchaser, subchaser number 140. They built all these small boats because they were getting very, very concerned and rightfully so about the uh, uh, Nazi U-boats sinking ships and quite a few of them did come over and sink ships in American water. Walking through the patio, the Stockholm Pavilion, or the Sweden Pavilion rather. 
this is a one I, I like this picture so much. It's one of my rotating backdrops on my uh, uh, computer, changing my, my screen. Coca-Cola came out to the fair and they did a whole uh, shoot, which I ended up with a, a good number of pictures of at the fair. So here's a hostess from the uh, Swift Meat Company. And she's out there getting you uh, hopefully interested in drinking a nice fresh bottle of Coca-Cola. And we're gonna see some more uh, Coke's uh, uh, shots as we go by. Up on the hill of Klein looking down, AT&T Pavilion over here. You can see their logo, Giant Pavilion, this whole section is all AT&T. Again, 1940, you can see the name has gone off the uh, uh, pavilion and it's just being used for storage and unfortunately sit, just sitting there kind of empty. Uh, unfortunately here, what goes up is coming down, the Trilon and Perisphere in 1940-41 uh, being torn down. The gypsum cover is being taken off and uh, all the steel is getting ready to be recycled. Happier days, springtime, the trees are all flowering. Lots of Trilon and Perisphere. The Hello Klein from the bottom. The United States Pavilion. And this is a woman uh, dressed in traditional Czechoslovakian outfit. Again, the fair had tremendous number of national days. If you were from any country, country around, you were invited to come to the fair, celebrate your, your day, wear your native costume, and buy a ticket to get in. So this was worked out really well. People came to celebrate you know, Czech Day, Polish Day, you know, a whole bunch of things. And uh, uh, their families all came out. It was, it was a good, uh, good money raiser to bring people out there. <laughs> Wonder Bakery, for all of us that like Wonder Bread, here you go. And again, looking down from the uh, hill climb. The administration building, the first major building built, we saw that little one before, but then they built the uh, administration building. Uh, people may get a kick out of this one because uh, what are we looking at? Well, this is, became Grand Central Parkway. But uh, out here, uh, again, they got the logo. Uh, in later years, they had to add 1940 onto it. But they had a restaurant in here that they would bring all the VIPs in to wine them and dine them until there were restaurants open in the fair. And this is where the fair was actually run out of. And there was a bridge that went from this building into the main fairgrounds for all the VIPs so that they could come out here park, be wine and dine, and then taken in uh, to the park without having to mingle with the crowds. Nice aerial view, try, uh, the Tryon and Perisphere. Part of the Bell System Pavilion, how the, the telephone links us all together. I caught a big one, a really big one. Buy, sell. <laughs> AT&T, massive pavilion, big, big at the time. At this point in time, most people did not have their own telephone. And this was a big thing, trying to convince everybody that you could get one. Uh, if you go to my website, I have a section on restoring your own photos. And you can see what this picture looked like beforehand with the number of scratches and everything. And it took about two or three hours to get them all out of there. But uh, Firestone would uh, show you how they were making tires. And uh, they would, uh, you know, go in there and, and let you see it. And in this particular case, they would, uh, you know, give elephant rides. So here's the keeper, and this kid's lucky. He's getting an elephant ride around the World's Fair. You know, how much fun. Imagine going back to school and telling all the kids what you did for your weekend, right? More for train enthusiasts. They brought trains from around the world. So over here you have the uh, 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 British one. The, uh, I think this is the Coronation Scott. Italian trains and all different ones. In some cases, they had to lay the tracks. Well, these were all tracks laid for the fair, but in some cases, they had to lay them very differently because some of these trains use different uh, gauge rail lines than uh, we use here in the US. Uh, in this particular one, you can see that this is an electric train. So they had the uh, cantonaries and uh, power lines up ahead. So most of these did not operate uh, at the fair. Uh, they, they were brought put on display. But things like the Coronation Scott took quite a whistle stop tour from the time it was brought over in a ship, went around the Eastern United States, uh, drawing up interest in the fair. 
So it could run on American uh, rail lines, and it did. And then uh, some of these trains for some of the countries, unfortunately, like the Italian state railways, by the time the ferry ended, the uh, Italy was now in war the middle of World War II. So uh, I don't think the train ever got returned to them. We all know the big colorful cube lights for the uh, 64 for the luminaires, but uh, here's the lights for the 39. I would love to know if any of these survived anywhere. Just really wonderful street lighting fixtures. Port of States, uh, again, all the states that couldn't afford a major pavilion on their own were behind here. The guy over here ran a booth where he would guess your weight. And who wants a Coca-Cola? I don't know what pavilion these guys are associated with, but uh, they're all enjoying America's favorite soft drink. This is kind of really interesting. Crossley Radio, uh, Wayne, you've probably heard of Crossley Radios. Uh, they were a real big manufacturer of American electronic goods, can openers, uh, you know, mix masters, anything that had an electric cord in it. They were really big for radios and they decided to get into these uh, small little cars. This was basically the American version of a Volkswagen, super cheap to make, a very small engine. I think it was like a, a four cylinder engine, got incredible gas mileage and they, they got pretty good uh, uh, range on them. Uh, in this particular case, you can see one in the middle and just another one off to the side. There's, is somebody saying something? Well, there's uh, actually a memo uh, I have of the World Square Corporation to the Crosley Corporation saying if your girls demonstrating the cars don't stop speeding through the fairgrounds, we're going to uh, take away the cars and not let you demonstrate them at all. So they were strongly suggesting that they might want to put a governor on them or do something or just fire the girls and get new drivers. But the Crosleys were made until the early 40s, not a big hit, uh, very hard to find today. But uh, you had both Crosley hardtops and these gals are demonstrating the deluxe Crosley convertible. So. Uh, but it's, it was interesting that they really upset uh, the, the World's Fair uh, Corporation by being daredevils. Hmm. We're out in the power area. So we had Con Edison uh, over here, petroleum, uh, you know, just all sorts of things going on. General Motors, big uh, exhibit here and out front. They had the newest thing in uh, American uh, uh, industry, the diesel train engine. So steam was coming to an end, diesel was coming in and people could come and see a cutaway view of a uh, diesel, how it operated. And this is again, General Motors, people lined up going to see Futurama. Futurama being the number one draw at both the uh, 1939 and the 1964 World's Fairs. Nice nighttime view, all those spotlights which must have been scary for anybody flying into LaGuardia Airport. I, I guess, uh, you know, I hope you don't fly and want to get blinded. Back over to the Marine Building. This kind of interesting picture. This was uh, done for, uh, uh, I think it was done for a magazine, a nice uh, artist rendition of what the fair looks like. And I tracked it down. It still exists uh, up in a school up in Rockland County, New York, but uh, kind of a nice uh, view of, uh, you know, uh, artistic view, but it's pretty realistic as far as, you know, the fountains, you can see the Flushing River still ran through the site. Uh, today, it's been mostly uh, put into tunnels for the 64 World's Fair, but you can see how big a thing it was, it would actually link Meadow Lake all the way over, go underneath the Pennsylvania and state pavilions into the Fountain of the Nations and then out to uh, Flushing Meadows. Parachute jump again. Railroads on parade. Uh, mentioned some of the trains that operate. You didn't have things like the Royal Scott go through this, but they had a number of trains that would come out. Uh, we had seen a movie that we did a couple of weeks ago of a big rail show in Chicago. This was the same sort of thing. So you had, a matter of fact, a lot of the, uh, the trains were here were the ones also seen later in Chicago. So you had the DeWitt Clinton and the, the carriages, which look very much like stagecoach carriages. And uh, they actually fired these things up and ran them on a show several times a day. Now we're back to the Rockettes entertaining the uh, servicemen. So we're into the 002 pictures. And as World War I got, uh, sorry, World War II got closer and closer, this is uh, sailors out marching in the Court of Nations. More and more displays 
uh, recruiting activities. They would drive around here in tanks. They would bring out cannons uh, and lots of displays of uh, military uh, uh, troops shooting volleys into the air. Again, trying to get a big patriotic uh, response to get people to uh, go in and uh, sign up. The SS New Amsterdam, again, some of these pictures, people would be at the fair part of the day in the city of the rest. Big show of the streets of Paris, and you had Gypsy Rosalie, as I mentioned, they had adult entertainment, which uh, made a, a big difference between 39 and 64. Some of the statues and fountains. USSR at night. <laughs> and this is uh, just showing how things have changed. DuPont was, I'm uh, sorry, this is Westinghouse. And Westinghouse had this display. And then uh, for whatever reason, <laughs> they were predicting that in, 19, uh, in the future, that women would be wearing transparent skirts. So uh, it never came to be. But uh, somebody decided they had to get a picture of the Westinghouse. I, I do have some other nice pictures of the Westinghouse lobby that we'll see we get to. And this is again a, a picture I get a, a kick out of because you just look at it and it's a snack bar. But if you happen to zoom in on it, you can see that you can get yourself an orange crush. Again, it's not fully restored yet. And here's coming people leading a bunch of dairy cows on parade through the fair. So where they're going, I don't know. But uh, here's Coca-Cola, they had a, a thing over here. And uh, people were just wandering through with a bunch of cows. <laughs> Chrysler Motors. Oh, again, we're back here with the uh, Coca-Cola ad. Grandpa, Grandma, and the, the girl all enjoying a Coke. And he's got the daily newspaper, which came out for the fair. I actually zoomed in to make sure he's not looking at the ra racing sheet or anything. But it's a sheet of all the day's activities that you could pick up and tell you what shows and what uh, exhibits were doing what. And again, just everybody's so well dressed. Part of the New York Fire Department uh, exhibit again. This is a, a modern 1939 ambulance and uh, what they call a dressing station. And again, if there was a major uh, incident, excuse me, they would bring this out and they could start, uh, you know, uh, getting everybody uh, fixed up. And then you can see that they would keep in here surgical bags, poison antidotes, burn bags, inhalators, surgical bags, splints, and more. So uh, very well equipped for its time. Ford, remember the Ford flags out front when well, it was just Ford, Mercury, Lincoln, uh, all the different brands they had. And again, these people are getting driven by professional Ford drivers on this test course it didn't have anything of particular interest, uh, like in the 64 fair, you didn't go through a, a world of dinosaurs, but you got to go in air conditioning, which was a real big thing. And for you to be sitting in a car and realize Ford cars could or could not come without air conditioning, maybe your next car would be a Ford. Fountain of the Adams, a uh, great little figure, all these little bronze figures around it, uh, little nymphs dancing around. And again, the hats, I just, you, know, you, you see all the pictures of, you know, uh, you know, the princesses uh, and everybody over at, uh, you know, Epson races and Derby Day and everything. Uh, they had nothing on on how the average fair uh, fair goer dressed in this point in time. Here is Waylon again telling you we'll be back in 1940 and well the fair was back Rover but not you. It was unfortunate that you know. Politics being the way that it was, a lot of people only agreed to come back if it was new cost-cutting management. Grover never met a dollar bill he didn't like to spend, and he was not the guy to cut costs. So the new guy came in, was a real penny pincher. This 30, the 1940 season actually was more profitable than the 39 fair, but it wasn't enough to wipe out the debts of 1939. So as a two-year run, it, it did lose money. There was big talk about trying to bring it back for one more year for 1941, because if we made so much money in 1940, maybe we can wipe out the debts. By that time, a lot of the exhibitors said, I don't want to take the chance. And with World War One, I, uh, I keep saying World War One, World War Two getting closer and closer and inevitable, the appetite just wasn't there. And a lot of the national, uh, international pavilions said, we're heading home. We got bigger problems to deal with than this. 
So here was a, another Greyhound uh, thing. They, they had the uh, trackless train we saw before. They also had Greyhound buses that would go on special dedicated bus lanes uh, around the fair. Here's again the towers, the Corona entrance to the fair. Kodak again, down below, you can see, I'll zoom in here for you, but you can see they're promoting the cavalcade of color. And that was again, a big thing, color photography, uh, amazing new invention. You gotta come in and see it. New York City Pavilion, and uh, hopefully someday somebody can convince them to restore those fountains to operation. And this was an interesting one. A uh, fell on uh, gal went up to the top of the Lifesavers parachute jump and it got stuck. And they were lowering them down and they came out with this net here in case uh, the thing fell and they had to catch them. I don't know how much luck they would have in catching them. Uh, so the fire department had brought out their net. And this was the net they would always put under jumpers in, in buildings, that sort of thing. Uh, unfortunately, the man and woman were not married to each other. And when the stories got out in the newspaper, I, it apparently it led to two divorces uh, mm -hmm. because uh, their uh, other spouses didn't know that they were there at the World's Fair. So you can imagine if you have the bad luck to go on a uh, secret rendezvous and get stuck at the parachute jump and then have your name in the New York Times. I'm sure that was not their intent that day. And you lose a lot in black and white, unfortunately, that uh, this pavilion was a brilliant blue color out here, uh, petroleum pavilion. But it was, again, a, a great thing. This is basically fabric going around a building and it made it look a lot bigger than it actually is. Out here is an oil well. We still have uh, some of these wells. There's uh, some that look pretty much like this, about a mile and a half from my house, still operating. So. Uh, you know, the, the little uh, donkey uh, engines back then are still this thing pumping oil today. Speed, wonderful statue, again, an Underwood and Underwood print. The Astronomer. We'll end in a moment or two, but just some general views of the fairgrounds, the New York City Pavilion we know. USSR. Again, enjoying herself at the fair. White gloves to the ready. This kind of interesting one here shows the uh, issues they had with the uh, gypsum surface of the, uh, the uh, perisphere. Originally, it was supposed to be concrete. It was all going to be done uh, nice and smooth and troweled on and everything. And then they realized they could not afford the amount of uh, money it would take for concrete. So it was engineered to hold concrete but they put gypsum on it. Well, gypsum is a water soluble uh, uh, item and water would start getting into the boards and start bubbling them out. So you can start seeing different distortions through the uh, 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 area. The fountains here also originally came all the way up to the base of the uh, perisphere and they were eating it alive. So they had to drop the fountains down to a much lower height. Uh, between the seasons, they had to do a tremendous amount of work to uh, get this thing back into shape because, um, again, it was the, the material is just not meant for, for bad weather. Coke had a number of these stands around the facility, and they also had a Coca-Cola bottling plant. So they were, you know, mentioning it up there that you could go and, uh, and go visit it. What's really, again, a kick if you start zooming in on these things. You can make out, you know, the, the type of uh, uh, straws that they were looking here. It's the originators of the sanitary soda straws. And then over here, you could get a whole bunch of little, I think I can zoom in a little more. A bunch of nice little snacks that are available over here. So uh, again, I, I just love what you can get out of a nice 35 millimeter print or a negative. This is a mural. This was done for the pharmacy pavilion. Uh, again, it was really great that some of these uh, murals that were re uh, recorded in color and saved for posterity because the buildings were all torn down and the murals just ripped out and not saved at all. Again, a 1939 view because Rush is there. Forge, you can tell if it's 39 or 40 because they took this winged mercury and put him uh, uh, down at one level and put them up for uh, 1940 up higher to make them more visible. 
but he's all made out of metal showing that four can do all sorts of things with metal. And this is inside, this is called the cycle of production. It was a giant carousel that rotated with an aeration that would talk about how uh, we'll take a uh, item here in the rain forest of uh, you know, South America, bring it over here and uh, do this, this and that. And it becomes part of the fabric for, for seed. Uh, as the carousel would go around, here's uh, iron pellets. They get taken down, they get uh, uh, put into a uh, you know, mine. Uh, they come out of the mine, they go into a refinery and they become the steel framework of a car. So the loudspeaker is going around uh, and as this thing rotated, they the lights would come on and display each of the various uh, steps of the processing. And they would show up at the top, here's uh, you know, all these raw material down here works its way up and it becomes a, a brand new Ford. The test track, one of the Greyhound buses. After the war, uh, after the fair ended, a number of these buses ended up at military plants uh, used to take the uh, workers from their parking lots into the uh, airplane factories. So uh, try to find out if any of them survived the war and nobody's been able to find any after that, but they, they did have a, a post-fair life. And here's one of the trackless trains. This uh, can be dated in 1940 because this one's taken an American Jubilee, it was the second major stage uh, show and pageantry added for the uh, uh, second year of it. Again, the Corona Gate. And here's somebody taking a picture of a photographer, taking a picture of another photographer. So life goes on. Pennsylvania Pavilion. Again, more exhibits going around. And here's again another one for street lights. Like, you know, we all talk about the 64 lights. Well, here are a whole bunch of lights. You all wonder if they show up in some other carnival. Yeah, you know, I mean, too big for somebody's backyard, but you know, it would be a shame to just chuck out. It'd be nice to know if they survived in somebody's uh, pavilion. In the background, you could see part of the hucksterism that made uh, the area so much fun. You could go see a giant electric eel and watch it shocking things. And they would actually do that. They'd have the eel out there, throw some fish in there, the eel would shock it and eat it. And just hopping around with some general views, more of the street lights there. West Virginia, a number of the pavilion, a, a, a nation, uh, number of the states rather had their own pavilions. Uh, there were a lot of them looked like they're old original state houses. The Court of Power going towards the Plaza of Light. And New York City fire back in the uh, steam powered fire engine days. And again, another view of the cycle of production with a cleverly concealed uh, uh, loudspeaker system. But if you look any closer at it, you can see that they're forming copper here and they're doing a thermostat insert. Over here, they have an electric furnace, you know, various uh, signs and elements that let you know what you're, so you're smelting ore down here. And again, it all worked its way up. So you see there's a factory down here and the little trains are bringing the stuff up and they're putting it all together and they're making the crankshafts, the wires and the rest of your modern Fords. More pictures of Kodak. GM was always a very popular line. And here's one, for example, I do not know what this statue is. I've not been able to find her in any other pictures or, or pavilions. If anybody is able to relocate it uh, or locate her uh, down here, if you look in the background, you can see it looks like the Swiss pavilion down here, the tantalizing, almost visible sign over here. If anybody happens to know who this uh, young lady is, please do let me know. At night, Riders of the Elements. Again, so sad that these statues didn't exist uh, last after the fair, but they were made out of plaster, gypsum, and other non-permanent materials. And by the end of 1940, they were in pretty sad shape. This is outside of Ford, again, uh, uh, this is called a textile structure. Uh, I think it was outside of Ford, but again, a big thing making metal statues at that uh, particular time. 
the uh, Great Britain Pavilion down below and Italy up behind it. This was a great one. Uh, Rockwell Kent did this for General Electric. Uh, this was one of the murals that were inside showing how electricity has done such wonderful things for us. And then we'll end in a moment or two. Well, this was a stage over at the Ford Pavilion. Uh, there was a uh, demonstration underneath of an electronic instrument called the theremin, which you may have heard about. And uh, they would uh, give or, uh, orchestra concerts uh, down below this uh, little stage area. Uh, over here, the gas pavilion is saying that uh, if you had a thousand cubic feet of gas, it will freeze 500 drinks, you know, so all sorts, and it rotated around on the other side, we'll come back and tell you other odds and ends. So this is actually down below the display. I think this was a mirror and, and it rotated around. The Great White Way, come on over, have a great time. More of Kodak. And they did rotate these pictures through. And some nighttime shots, the Fountain of Nations. I always try to figure out where did this door go? What was inside? You know, somebody on line right now trying to get information about the pump room for the 64 fair that pumped the, all the water for the Unisphere. Anybody have any pictures of it? What's in here? It's probably just the janitor closet, but it's, it's tantalizing. It's an unknown part of the fair. Schaefer boasted they the biggest bar in the world. There's one shot of guys repairing the uh, perisphere that I was hoping to find. This one I left in here, it's a little blurry, but it's kind of interesting because here's the Fountain of Nations uh, and again, low tide. Just like in 64, they let the tide go out. They walked over here and put, in, these are all the launchers out here for all the fireworks that'd be occurring at night and water nozzles for the show. And here's the major fountains and interior hidden speaker systems would play out. Oh, she shows up again. This is one I would have loved. Uh, as the Boy Scouts, we had an exhibit at the 64 World's Fair, but we were housed off site and we'd bring in on buses in the morning. 39, they actually let the Boy Scouts stay on site so that uh, they would be there 10 in the, in the morning to 10 at night. Uh, they would be there giving tours, visitors welcome, and they would you know, show you how uh, tie knots and all the rest of it. But then at night, when everybody went home, you got to camp at the World's Fair. I mean, just think how cool that would be to be, you know, able to, I'm sure, you know, they would probably not encourage to run around running amok at night, but knowing myself, I'd say I could get over that fence. <laughs> I'd be out having the time of my life. So yeah, in 64, it was fun. In, in 39, man, the idea of staying overnight in a World's Fair. Wow, that's cool stuff. Oh boy, I'm probably getting tired of fire trucks, but here's an 1882 version. Uh, these rails here would fold down and you would stand on one side and the people would stand on the other side and this would pump back and forth. And that would how you got water into uh, the fire back at that point in time. All 100% man labor. More forward with a little stage down below. Well, it's 5,000 drinks for a thousand cubic feet of uh, gas. That's good to know. And again, I think we'll end now at the Great White Way. You could come over here and see models posing. Actually, I may have, the next one might be a model posing. No, well, I'll end here. 39, a Salvador Dali inspired picture at the Kodak exhibit and getting uh, views of a giant telephone and of course melting clocks and all the rest of it. And it's Kodak, so we have to have a camera in here. My goodness, how many things in chat. I, if I made that many mistakes today, I'm gonna be really, really embarrassed. So let me stop sharing here. And I will have to go through and uh, look at through all these, but uh, uh, so thoughts. Uh, uh, yes, Scott, if you remind me later, I, I will be glad to send you copies of any of the uh, New York uh, 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 fire uh, exhibits. If you want just the 1912, I can send you that, but uh, I'll be glad to send you any, any of those. Yeah, Derek, back up your photos. Uh, you have a friend who's an IT professional lost an entire vacation worth of photos. You know, Carol knows this story. We have a neighbor three houses down called up one day that uh, their computer was acting up 
and uh, could I come down? And they, they were running, I think they were still running Windows 98 or something. And they, their, their computer was just hosed. The hard drive was absolutely a total mess. And uh, I asked, okay, where's your backup? Didn't have any. And well, he had all his daughter's wedding photos on it. You know, all sorts of stuff. And it was just the one copy. So I, I worked saw about a solid eight hours and got the computer back running, booting. And uh, it was like, you know, again, I, I, I forget what version of Windows I was running, but it was, I still had luckily Windows 98 CD. So I came down home and try to rebuild it. And I'm trying to find the drivers for his uh, printers and his, you know, everything. He's really busy because it was some exciting football game he had to watch. And I'm calling, Alan, get your ass down here, right? So I get the computer going. And uh, he was very happy. And he and his wife took me and Carol out to dinner to thank us. And I told him, you need to back this thing up because it's not a question of when it's going to happen or, or if it's just when. So, uh, you know, and you try to tell him that you can get a, a CD uh, burner, you know, for $300 at Office Depot, you know, and just put it all in CDs or an external hard drive. He calls me two weeks later, his computer's acting up. And I said, well, you know, uh, Thank God he did a backup. No, he hadn't gotten around to it. He's waiting for them to go on sale. <laughs> so I went down there and I, I, I put it together. I got it going again. I said, Alan, this is the absolute last time I will ever do this for you. I will not come back and do it again. You will go out tomorrow. You will buy a hard drive. You will back this up. I will help you with that, but I will never bring your computer back to life again. And luckily he did go and get it. But I made my living my, for several years as a consultant by finding out how many companies had not backed up their computer systems. Because in the days of mainframes, there was a giant department that did it, right? Now that everybody had their own server in their department, nobody did it. So I was getting called into companies, uh, uh, you know, uh, mo uh, several major entertainment companies and going over to like 20th Century Fox. You don't have any backups of any of this? No. Uh, well, we're going to get on it right now. And it, it's just, that's why I say in 80 years, the prints, or the negatives are still going to be out there. Anything on a computer server today, good luck in 80 years trying to revive that back. So I beg and be, be, beseech every, how many people here don't have a good backup? I'm looking at you. I'm going to come and get you. <laughs> Luckily, everybody says they do. It is, it, 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 I would come home from work at times just pounding my head against the wall about how stupid these people were. And Carol reminded me, that's why our kids are going to college without loans. I said, okay, you're right. <laughs> if they weren't stupid, I wouldn't have done, you know, had the business I had. But it was, it was really astonishing. I mean, I mean, it was at these Fortune 100 companies and they had gotten rid of their major IT department, decentralized everything, and just didn't think about backups. So... It, uh, and that's why I am a real nut. I have at least five copies of everything, on, on, uh, several on site, on the cloud, multiple cloud. I actually use two cloud backups so in case one goes away and the other one's there. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a fanatic about it because I don't want to ever have to fire myself. So, Okay, so let me just go through. Any other thoughts, comments? Anybody, uh, after seeing all the uh, 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 ships, anybody ready to join the Merchant Marine? <laughs> I will. I will. You know, I thought about it really, really much. I, I was really gung ho for the John and Merchant Marine. I mentioned my dad was in the shipping business and uh, I'd go and meet with the ship captains and they came in from all these wonderful places. And I was just really gung ho for it. And I got admitted to the uh, New York State Maritime Academy at Fort Scholar. And uh, I was all, all set. And I failed the Coast Guard line officer exam because I wear glasses and if a wave had washed off my glasses, I couldn't have been a deck officer. So, all right, I won't go to the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, I'll go do something else. Well, then after that, the U.S. Merchant Marine totally collapsed. I was the luckiest guy. I am so glad I wear glasses because there are no U.S. ships anymore. I'd be, you know, on some living in tanker sailing out of, um, you know, uh, Nepal or some stupid thing. I mean, it was just unbelievable. So. You know, it's just funny how the things work, uh, but yeah, I, I, I really was, I wanted to be on ships so bad. Thank God I have bad eyes. Hey, Bill. Yeah, Joey. No, uh, it's Randy. Oh, I'm sorry, Randy. Yeah. Hey, I, I mentioned in the comments, um, the Europa became the Liberté. Um, you know, for, it was given to France mm -hmm. 
as war reparations for their loss of the Normandy, essentially. Right. You know, I mean, basically, it was New York Fire Department's prompt fault that the Normandy sank, but um, but yeah, so the um, the Roman became a liberty, and it was yeah you know, uh, refitted to look more French in, in flavor and all that. Then the other ship that you had sh you showed with the really low uh, smokestacks. Uh, that was kind of a popular design for a while, but I know some of the German ships had that. They look really sleek, but these women would be out on deck in their fancy outfits and get soot all over them. Yeah, I know there was one ship I was reading about uh, a couple of weeks ago where you know they went off and they did their first uh, year of cruising and they took it right back to the shipyard and they added yeah. on about another 10 feet of uh, funnel just because of, of that. That was one of the German ships, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, uh, interesting how, uh, you know, things look really good on paper. <laughs> right. Look really good on, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the design. And then when you get out there, you're choking in this stuff. Yeah, and some of those ships, by the way, uh, some of the ocean liners had uh, dummy funnels because the idea was if you had a, uh, a ship that was a, uh, a one funnel ship, you, you went so fast. Two funnels had to go twice as fast because you had twice as many motors. Well, if you had three ships, with some of the ships, they, they would actually use the dummy funnel for a kennel area. But if you were taking your dogs from, uh, you know, uh, Europe and, you know, back and forth, you know, the, the passengers would get there, they'd see this great three funnel ocean liner. And then, you know, there's a door in the funnel and you take out to the, the kennel inside. Yeah, the third funnel on the Normandy was just uh, the air conditioning plant. And the Normandy was a real shame. I may have mentioned it before, but my grandfather ended up in a unit at the uh, fire department where he would uh, basically do postmortems on things the fire department did on what went right and what went wrong. And he worked on the uh, the B-25 that flew into the Empire State Building, you know, trying to do how do we, you know, do better at that. But he wrote a report on the Normandy and I had it. I don't know where it went. I hope I still have it in a box. But he basically talked about how at any major event, you need to have a uniformed command. That it, one guy is designed as El Jefe for it, all this stuff. Because at the Normandy, everybody was running hoses, everybody was pumping water, everybody was doing this, and nobody was watching what the other guy was doing. And uh, they, they basically sunk the ship because they put too much water in it. And it could have been saved. You know, it would have been better to let it just go straight down, you know, sink in the, the mud at the bottom of the thing. But they were all pumping water in, and I mentioned boats like the firefighter. They came alongside and were pumping massive amounts of water in, and the ship just uh, flipped over. So, uh, yeah, too much water at the top. That was the issue. It was too much water pumped into the top structure of the ship, and it got top heavy. And, and yeah, over. yeah, it was a real shame. And yet, you know, people don't realize, uh, learn anything uh, because, again, one guy has to be in charge, right? When I went to work on submarines, we'd have to go to all these uh, big safety meetings, which I was happy to go to because I wanted to learn how not to sink the submarine. But Mare Island Naval Shipyard had an incident where they had a submarine that was just being redone. It was, it was not a new one, but it had been refitted. And it was sitting at the, uh, the dock. And they had uh, guys working in the engine room that were doing something and guys working up in the forward torpedo room doing something else. And the guys in the engine room wanted to put a five degree uh, port list or starboard list on the ship so they could get all the water to go from some of the bilge tanks and the other tanks. So they flooded a tank and the thing went up so they could get easier access. Well, the guys in the, uh, uh, up in the front were trying to do some of the gyroscope and they wanted it level. So they went and they reflooded it. And the guys in the back flooded it back and the guys in the front flooded it back. The guys walk in sentry duty up and down the, the deck of the ship, and all of a sudden he realizes his feet are going slosh, 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 because now the thing is getting that low. And so he yells for everybody to get out of the ship, and they couldn't get it. Uh, they, everybody got out, but they couldn't close the hatches because all the hatches had cables, steam pipes, phone lines, everything else going in. And the ship now sunk. The, the whole sum, uh, uh, sub sunk right at the dock massive job of getting it back up everything and it was ruined all the electronics and all because everything's seawater and i and remember they were talking about how they they court-martialed the captain of the ship who was 50 miles away at home having breakfast or something and we were tasked to come up with an idea of how do you if, a, if this ever happens again 
how do you come up with a quick disconnect for all the things that were going through the hatch so that uh, you could you know break apart the electrical connection and drop it down so we designed this thing and we we're saying can you imagine some poor sailor i mean this thing was like a 440 volt uh, thing he's going to be walking on the deck his feet are sloshing in salt water as he's walking in the metal deck of a ship and you're going to expect him to spring this 440 volt connector apart I don't think they've ever had to use one, but I sure as hell know I would just get off the ship and let it sink before I open that sucker up. <laughs> so, so much for uniform commands. Hey, Bill. Yeah, hi, Wayne. Yeah, you uh, talked about the uh, promotion of color uh, photography, and that reminded me that the Viewmaster was introduced at the 39th Fair. But the thing I wondered, and I haven't seen information on, is how did they introduce it? Did they have a permanent location, or did they just issue a press release? I don't think they had anything at the fair itself as far as a booth or a display or anything. Uh, I think it just came out, you know, that uh, they were there doing. There was there's something I was re remember reading about why they didn't have something at the fair, and, and there was something to do with. I think when it came out, whether it was the copyright or the patent or something, there was some a, a sort of legal reason where they had where they did what they did in the sequence that they did it because you needed. And I, again, I don't remember all the details, but uh, it, I guess the way the reels are labeled, you can tell where they came out in some sequence because whether they had copyright protection but not patent yet or or birth of ice or whatever they did, there was some sort of Thing that screwed up their initial plans to release it as some big gala thing. Yeah, the uh, online uh, wiki uh, says that the uh, original viewer was stamped and patent applied for. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. I mean, the, the, again, 30, the, when the Viewmaster came out, you know, thank God color had just come out because that wouldn't have been so popular in black and white, would it? I'm just reading all the thing here. Uh, oh, wonderful Adam, uh, Warner Brothers show, Pinky and the Brain did a whole episode on fedoras and the 39th, I have to look for that one, the fedoramatic. Carol actually met the guy that played uh, uh, the brain at, at something and he came to the house for dinner one night and it was really just a cool thing. So I said, you, you gotta tell me, you know, uh, you gotta say, it goes, okay, after dinner, we will take over the world. You know, he, it was just so crazy to be having dinner with, you know, the brain. And he did said, he have, what's that? Did the, did the pinky, uh, the voice guy for pinky, did he have like an Australian accent in real life? Or was that just something done for the show? We had, the, the guy that was here was the brain. So, oh, the brain. Okay. Yeah, right. So I don't know about pinky. He never came over for dinner, but you know, uh, but he was just sitting here across the dinner table talking about taking over the world. <laughs> that was the best. That was the best animated show, I think, of the whenever it was on the '90s or whatever. I'm gonna have to go look that up for Doramatic. That sounds. Yeah, like he, his his plan story. was, uh, all the men would have fedoras put on their heads by the Fedoramatic, and that would control their brains, and that he would take over the world that way. Yeah, yeah. part of the World's Fair is mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, that's really funny you mentioned it because I'm a big Doctor Who fan and they did an episode like that on Doctor Who where everybody was, you know, get these free Bluetooth headset type things. Everybody, they're really free. Get all the ones that you want. You know, da -da. bam, all of a sudden it turns them into cyborgs. So I guess that the one idea goes around and around. I'm going to have to look for that. Thank you. Clinton Castle. Yeah, that was the uh, uh, castle down at the, the lower end of Manhattan that uh, had so many multiple uses. I'm taking a look. Somebody asked if, if uh, Piggy had an Australian accent. That's actually Rob Paulson. He played a lot of voices, and he's uh, not, he's complete American. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks. No amazing. We, we, we've known different people to do some of these voices, and it's amazing how many of them they can do and how differently they, they can sound. Mm -hmm. It's a hard job, actually. Yeah. Uh, Bill? Yes. Yeah, Joey here. Hi, Joey. Um, whatever happened to Grover Whalen after the fair? He, he got basically retired. Grover had a great job. If I come back with my time machine, I'm going to go get Grover's job because 
he became, he had all sorts of jobs. He was a police commissioner of the city in New York. Uh, he had right. all sorts of different roles and he ended up getting a job as the official greeter of the city of New York. So anytime some celebrity came to town, Grover would take him out to dinner and take him to a Broadway show, get his picture taken with him. And, you know, he was like the guy that knew everybody. After the fair ended, he retired. I don't think he had any particular role. He uh, was, uh, they, they made him a honorary type consultant for the uh, 64 World's Fair just to get his name on the, uh, the letterhead and everything. I don't know if he went, because I don't remember what year he died. I know his family, Grover's family did go to the 64 Fair, but I don't know if, if he did or not. But I think he basically just went into, uh, you know, uh, you know, semi-obscure retirement at, at that point in time. Uh, yeah. He, he was a he was like a real showman. Uh, I, I think I've shown pictures of uh, in my book. I have the picture. I didn't know who she was at the time. I don't know how I didn't know it. But it was it was with El, uh, uh, President Roosevelt's mother, and he's in the car. He's got his custom made convertible, and he had this whole control panel in there where he could uh, use a PA system or shine lights on things. And this whole and definitely <laughs> the car is in a museum today. But he just couldn't ride around in any car. He had to have the special Grover Wayland PA system car. And he, he, was, he was a real showman. You know, and again, like a lot of people make fun or hate Robert Moses for a variety of reasons. Grover Wayland was the same sort of thing. He, you know, everybody oh, lost damn money. Well, it wouldn't have gotten built in the first place if he hadn't been there as such a, uh, you know, uh, you know show, uh, a, a spokesperson or, uh, you know, a, a salesman for it. So, uh, yeah, the 39 fair lost money, but, um, um, you know, it, oh, Randy's mentioned another one here, uh, the, the uh, infamous film, The Last Voyage, the slow, painful demolition of the Alta of France. Movie, I think it's Robert Stack, is that who's in it? Robert Stack and Dorothy Malone, yeah. Yeah, I, I've got a copy of it. It's a fascinating movie, and I think you can find it on YouTube and some other places. Uh, they go well, off It's on Turner every once in a while, too. Is it? Yeah, yeah I, I sent a copy of it to a, a friend of ours who's a real cruise ship guy, and he was like horrified. What they did was they wanted to film this movie about a ship going out, and it's all worn out, it's falling apart, you know, sort of like the, the same sort of plot of the uh, uh, Poseidon adventure. But they have a problem, and the ship sinks. And they went off, and the movie company bought the Isle de France, changed the name on it, and the colors and that, everything, but they took it out, and they would actually flood the ship. So rather than doing it with a model ship in a tank, they would take the real ship and flood it. And I, I don't remember if it was going down bow first, I think it was most of the scenes where Andy did it. Since I've seen it. I don't yeah. Know. But they would get it way up there and then they would stop and they would ride it up again, go back the next day, flood it again. And they did a scene in the ballroom where the ship is going down and uh, the water is bursting through the windows. And the way they did that one was they hired a whole bunch of fire boats and they put all the actors and actresses in the, uh, 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 the, the dining room and they're all eating, having a great time. All of a sudden the ship starts sinking and the water comes blasting through the windows because the fire boats with their super high pressure hoses were six feet offside the, the thing just blow. I mean, they did a hell. And then they would write it up again, you know, and go off and do yeah. that. You know, Bill, ever when that happened, yeah, um, the French line, was horrified, obviously, because the ship was very recognizable. It had been famous, as yeah. famous as Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth for decades. And uh, so from then on, when they uh, jumped a ship, it was signed into the contract that they, you know, they had to go right to the, the, either it was sold to another cruise line or it went right to the junkyard. Yeah. No, yeah. You know, nothing else could be done with it that would cause that kind of embarrassment. Yeah, you know, you think, what would they care? They sold it, what do they care? But it'd be like if somebody bought your house that you grew up in, and you know, you like to think they're going to live in there, and instead they decide to just blow it up and, you know, or burn it down or, so, you know. It happens all the time where I was raised up in Santa Clara, San Jose area. You know, the little 1940s track houses that are now selling for $2 million. Yeah. On bigger lots. You know, people will buy them and uh, build McMansions. Yeah. You watch your, you know, the home you were raised in just get uh, torn down. If you get a chance, you go go look for the movie, The, the Last Voyage. And uh, like I said, that's movie making on an epic scale. No models, no miniatures, no CGI. Let's take a full thinking ocean liner and half sink it out in whatever ocean they were in. I think they were filming it off of Japan or someplace. Yeah, it was supposed to be a Pacific cruise, not an Atlantic cruise. Yeah, so 
I think it was scheduled to go to a, a, a wrecking yard in Japan. Right. If I remember correctly. And yeah, so that's, you know, it was not too far off Japan. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was an amazing film. Let me just scroll through some more of these. Uh, While you're scrolling, I'd yeah. like to recommend that people look up the uh, Groucho Marx uh, singing uh, Lydia, the Tattooed Lady, and listen for the mention of Grover Waitland. <laughs> yeah. And Wayne, I, I love your TV set in the background with the Happy Easter on it. Bill, when you have a second, Thank I you. have a vintage camera here that probably would have taken some other pictures that you showed. Yeah, that's really neat. Nice bellows. What kind of camera is that, Richard? This is an Autograph 3A, which was old in 1930, I guess. They probably stopped it. But it's got a unique format. It's got almost like a, a wide angle format to it. Um, but the reason I, I thought of it was because in the back of this thing, there is a little flap that exposes where the paper backed negative was. And it had a little stylus where you could actually write in the margins oh. what your thing was. And I think that's what my grandfather did. Now, what we, what you showed us had um, those white images in landscape mode. So that's not how they did it. But that was common for a camera like this that you'd write down on the back of your negative what it was you shot. That's really nice. That's, that's really neat. What uh, size film did he use? Do you know? That's, what I was gonna ask. Yeah. that's to me interesting. This is a bellows camera with a long focal length, which throws the image <laughs> into about three and a half by six inches or so. Yeah, I, I have quite a few. And some of these uh, images I showed today that size, that's why they have so much, uh, you know, uh, size. Now, it's really interesting because on cameras like yours, finding them with an intact bellows can be really tough. So many of them have dried out and yeah. where they would collapse on the scene, they just, you know, emit light through it. But yours looks in really nice shape. Yeah, well, well, my grandfather had something like this and I had it to play with. And then I recognized this at a, at a camera show. So I just picked it up. But the nice thing about this was the negatives were so big that you didn't need an enlarger in order to make pictures if you wanted to roll your own and do that. Uh, so, do you collect cameras, Richard? Um, only about a half a dozen or so. Oh. You know, a couple. And they're, they're the, the simple cameras that I had when I was a kid. Right. I still have some of my uncle's cameras. I, I've mentioned in the past that I got into photography. My uncle Steve would, uh, you know, buy a camera and uh, you know, give me his old one. And you know, Aunt Loretta was like, she bought another camera. Well, Bill needed another one. And you know, it was great. Uh, but he helped me tremendously with, uh, and I still have some of his, I've got, I don't even remember what brand it is, uh, one of his Bellows cameras, but it can't be used because the, you know, the fabric or whatever it's made of is dried and there's some pinholes in it. But uh, he had a whole bunch of uh, exactas from uh, when they were made in East Germany and just all sorts of, I got my grandfather's really ancient old uh, uh, first generation Polaroid camera. Again, you can't find film or anything for these, but you know, being part of the family, I, I just can't bear, bear to get rid of them. So um, I was actually cleaning out a box the other day and I found a bunch of old flash bulbs. So maybe I'm gonna put those on, on eBay because uh, I'm not gonna use them, but maybe somebody would like to buy some real genuine 1940 flash people, bulbs. People do collect flash bulbs. Yeah. <laughs> You, know, you mentioned the uh, picture behind uh, Randy. Carol stepped away right now, but that was one of her big uh, hobbies for years was dyeing those Ukrainian Easter eggs. And uh, you know, maybe I can get her someday to talk to you and how it's done. But it's an amazingly intricate thing where you put wax on it, dye it, take the wax off, dye it again, do it. I mean, and you got to plan out your design. You know, because uh, each layer of color becomes multiple multiple on top of others but uh, she we have a whole shelf full she's she must have 40 of them sitting on shelf or in a basket in the room that uh, where her computer is and she's she got an award from at the la county fair and stuff so she was really into that for the longest period of time and then, you know, that, was, that was wayne you said you, you mentioned my name 
Yeah. Oh, that looks like an Easter egg, but it's not. It's, so you uh, mentioned, yeah, you mentioned Wayne, and I mentioned the one behind Wayne. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Then she got into uh, things like uh, uh, what you call it, um, ostrich eggs, which are really big, and so it turns out they take a lot of dye, and, and you know, doing an uh, egg, you get a, get a little thing, but where do you come up with bats to dye ostrich eggs? So I was joking, I'd go and get something like a dodo egg or something, but you know. Just, just one of the hobbies that she, you know, we all pick up over time. So, uh, yeah, just again, we didn't get all the way through 39, but maybe next week uh, I'll pick up in 39, and then we'll get off to uh, San Francisco. But I, I just get a, a real kick out of going back to these uh, uh, old events. Like I said, the the minutia, uh, you know, you, you see the same pictures over and over. Bill Young and I, when we were doing the books on the 64 fair, Bill at one point said to me, if I look at one more picture taken of the Unisphere from the, taken from the New York State Pavilion on going to scream, you know, because everybody did it. And then you find some really esoteric, really weird little picture and go, oh, that's really cool. I didn't know that, how they did that. And that's why, like I said, of all my pictures, I just love the one with the guy buying his daughters an ice cream cone. You know, it's, it's just, it, it, it takes me back to, you know, taking my kids to parks or doing things with them. And it's just really great people caught some of these, uh, you know, uh, crazy little moments in time. So before we go, Harold, I want to ask you a question. I keep seeing pictures that you're posting up on online. Uh, do you have a lot of information on uh, uh, Toronto Transit in general? Is that one of your uh, avocations? Well, actually, I used to work for the Toronto Transit Commission for 29 years. Mm -hmm. And so I've been mainly getting the photos from other Facebook sites. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some rather good uh, sites. There's one called Transit Toronto, which is very good as far as history of the Toronto Transit system. Yeah, but, I was wondering um, if on Saturday you'd ever like to take us to Toronto. Oh. First of all, I like to, Toronto as a city. We've been, I've enjoyed being up there. But I, I really enjoy some of the pictures that you've posted. And, you know, as you can probably tell from things I collect, I'm a big nut on old buses, trains, yes. trolleys, things like that. So if I could twist your arm for some future Saturday, I think a lot of other people would like to see how it was done on your side of the border. Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll consider that. Yeah. You see, it's a friendly crowd, no virtual eggs being thrown. Exactly. <laughs> so, oh, great. Next week, I, again, I, I figure I'll probably finish what I didn't finish uh, this week. And then uh, two weeks from now, I'm going to be uh, giving tours of the police station at our annual pancake breakfast. So uh, uh, two, two weeks from now, everybody can sleep in or have lunch at the right time or whatever. Hey, Bill, is that yeah. that's open to the public, the tour? Yeah, yeah. Where can I find information? But is it like on oh, the LAPD website? Or? Yeah, and I, I can send it to you too. And then you know, Randy, uh, you know, being local, if you ever just want to come up and go on a ride along with us or anything, just let, let me know. Uh, I would love to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some I don't know if you saw like the thing I posted from yesterday. Uh, you know, the, the, some days like you were at yesterday, it was about as 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 exciting as watching paint dry. And we've had recruits that we come out, you know, and they, oh, and this is boring. And then you come up with a day like yesterday, because yesterday there was a uh, three-car uh, collision, including an overturned van in probably the busiest intersection in the San Fernando Valley. And it was right on the borderline between us and another division. And so I, I technically didn't need to go there, but I felt that bad that they were, you know, because we came down and looked at it, because it was on the south side of the street, it's their problem. The north side of the street, it was our problem. Sometimes you get them right on the line, but this was on, on their side. But I said, oh, I'll go over and help. And it turned out to be a, a, a you know, a, just a, a mess for traffic. But the thing that was really gratifying as I posted on Facebook was that, you know, there's always these idiots that drive by it. They'll give you the finger, they'll curse at you or whatever. And you're just trying to, you know, keep them from hitting anything else. Well, I had a guy yesterday came by Put on my hand to stop. He just looks at me, drives right by, and he also goes right through the red light that's behind me and just about nails somebody that's making a legal turn. And we're all, oh God, you know, and, and at other times it's happened before is there's enough officers there, one will go off and go get the guy, but there were just, you know, four of us dealing with this thing. But then he pulled, he, he got across the street and he pulled into a 7 Eleven parking lot to go inside and get a big gulp or something. And we said, I can't believe he just went over there. So that Two officers said, hey, you got the scene. We're going to go get this guy. They walked over 
and gave him a ticket for running a red light and failure to, uh, you know, observe the law of a traffic, uh, observe the legal orders of a traffic officer. So it made my day. You know, it was, I've had so many people blow by and, and do that sort of thing. It was uh, crazy. Carol, you were out. We were just mentioning real briefly. If you look behind Wayne, you'll see uh, the pictures of all the eggs. And I was talking about your Ukrainian Easter egg efforts. See there behind Wayne on the TV set? You're muted. Sorry. I saw that you had something on the screen, but I didn't notice what it was. Yeah. I don't think I have. I might have had some here. Yeah, so Randy, if you do come up, we'll be glad to, to take you out some time. And like I said, I can't yeah. promise you any day is going to be uh, exciting. But yeah, then we had a DUI to deal with that she was just really fun. Oh, there's one of Carol's eggs. It would be interesting. Um, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I can't see. <laughs> yeah, it's there. I'd All right. It. So this is one that I did. This is a goose egg um, that somebody gave me. And this is another another. Um, these are oh, Ukrainian Easter, or not Easter, Ukrainian eggs. Oh, you froze. I can't hear you. It's breaking up. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hold them up higher. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where to hold them where it doesn't That's get good. blocked out. Yeah, this was fine. from an old stamp, a postage stamp. Mm. Seems like I'm Bill, your internet, internet connection is unstable, it says. Huh. It's, it's the, it, when you, I guess it's all the tinfoil I put on the windows of the house to keep out the blood. Anyway, that's just. Yeah, she's got a whole basket full of them and uh, <laughs> yeah, mention it. I'm assuming they're hollowed out. Yes, they are. That what you have to do is when you're finished dyeing them, then you punch a little hole with a needle at one end and you start injecting air into the egg and letting the egg run out. And then you have to wash it out and let it dry. I mean, these are these are old now, but they're completely hollow. Those are but anyway, ostrich it's a very eggs. fragile art form. <laughs> Those are ostrich eggs, right? No, these are not ostrich. These oh. are goose eggs. Oh, goose ostrich, egg. okay. ostrich eggs are like this big. You can't do this with an ostrich egg. It's too thick. So did Bill no. have uh, scrambled uh, goose eggs for breakfast? No, <laughs> no, probably... because by the time I drain it out, it's probably not edible anymore. <laughs> That's the thing that fascinated me is you have to do all the work on it and then put a hole in it and hope that when you put in the hole in it, the whole thing doesn't explode on you. So you have all the thing and the dipping right. and the cooling and the right. painting, you know, and then... And the, and... I'm going to have to fix that. It's not painted. It's all dyed. I mean, it's all dipped. But right. one of our son's friends picked up one of my chicken eggs and dropped it, and that was the end of that. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's fascinating. She and you saw somebody else do it, and you got into it, right? Yeah, it was somebody at the float, at the Rose yeah. Float, who said, oh, if you'd like to learn, my sister and I are teaching people. And I just fell in love with it. So I did it for quite a while. And I started designing my own eggs uh, because that's kind of what I do. <laughs> and uh, then I don't know what happened. That was a few years ago. I think that was before I started teaching school and I didn't have time anymore. But I made a ton of them. Good stuff. And we made them for some friends and things like that. So, right. Well, I hope everybody has a great uh, Passover and a great Easter. And uh, uh, again, we'll meet you next week. And then, uh, Randy, uh, drop me a note. Uh, I, I basically go out on Mondays and Wednesdays as my uh, usual forte. Uh, we also have, you know, we have people go out night crews, uh, you know, basically. Uh, 20 hours a day we can fit something in there and uh, like I said most of the days are absolutely totally dull but uh, you know you'll get to see parts of the San Fernando Valley you've never seen before I can guarantee I haven't you. had much experience in the San Fernando Valley so actually I'm heading up to Studio City today for dinner with a friend and my uh, my car is in the shop and I'm using a loaner that doesn't have GPS so I'm going to be I'm going to be lost. I mean, I got to get my, my phone out and get it set up.
Well, we take people out and they said, I've lived here 20 years. I never knew the street was here. And you go, we well, never have any particular, you know, need to go through it. And that's through some of the warehouses and the industrial areas. But we also go through some of the residential areas that are just gorgeous. And you go, you know, again, unless you knew somebody up in that area, particularly up in a little mountain area, you'd have no particular reason to just randomly drive up there. So it's, uh, and I enjoy it. I mean, thing I enjoy every day is different. You know, I mean, uh, again, I, they give me a patrol sector to do, but I can decide if I go clockwise or counterclockwise, or if I do sector one before sector three or vice versa. So we just go out and have a good time. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's fun. Well, I hope everybody has a good, good time. Thanks for joining today and we will see you next week then. Hey, thank you, Bill. All right, take care. Bye.